I love Amphibia so much. I talk about it constantly, I make tons of memes and videos of it, I make plenty of friends from inside the community, I just have a lot of fun with this show. It almost seemed like the fun would never end, until it did. I was really sad that the show that I have had my eyes on ever since the sneak peek was released is over. I mean sure, the Amphibia community is still pretty much alive. The creator Matt Brawley tries his best to keep the fans fed during the eternal hiatus. Also we still have Marcy's journal coming our way this November and there will undoubtedly be some real truth bombs to be revealed there that I surely can't wait for. But the core show's production is over, it hurts. It does hurt, but I have thought of a video idea like this just before the show ended. I decided to rewatch the show before season 3B started and when the entire show was over, I rewatched the entire show again. And as a result, I have a better grip on how these episodes flow to each other and how each episode plays a part for the show. Because if there's one thing that this show doesn't have, it's a filler episode. Amphibia is just such a good show and I can get into why in a lot of different ways. That's why this won't be just a standard ranking list where I isolate each episode and talk about them individually and that's it. I will also try to get into the larger themes of this show and my experiences with the show's community that make this show a whole lot more interesting, at least for me. And remember, these are all my personal opinions. There will certainly be hot takes here and there, so prepare yourself. There are a total of 106 episodes to go through, and without further ado, let's hard stomp our way through this list. So there are really only 4 episodes that I think are not good. No, I'm not gonna spend every second of this video praising Amphibia, nothing is perfect, even my favorite animated show. And let's start with what I think is my least favorite Amphibia episode. Number 106, Cracking Mrs. Croker. If I can describe this episode in a word, it's contradictory. In the beginning, we see Sprig as this popular figure within the world with people. He's likable, he's being greeted by a lot of people, except Sadie Croker. But this contradicts best Franz, where we know that not many people get Sprig, they don't hang out with him often. But the former is the timeline that this episode exists in, so Sprig really tries to impress Mrs. Croker. And he does that by breaking into her house, messing with all of her stuff, and invites her longtime enemy to hunt her down. I wish I could make that stuff up. You know, to be fair, I feel it when a person just straight up doesn't like me for some unknown reason, although I don't relate to the part where everybody in town likes me. I have that frustration sometimes, and I think this message could be worked into a much more effective episode. I feel like this episode has its heart in the right place, but the execution leaves a lot to be desired. Do we really need a plot this exaggerated? Not really. Don't worry about it, dude. It's okay if one person doesn't like you. You know what, Anne? You're right! This is not okay! That's literally the opposite of what I just said. Honestly, I find these scenes to be ironically hilarious. Keep in mind that as we move along this list, there's an occurring trend where Sprig really tries his hardest to achieve his own goal without reflecting on what he's done until nearing the end. So we're gonna need a label on this kind of episodes. I'm gonna call it Sprigurated. One good scene in this episode though is when it's revealed that Hop Hop likes to yodel himself to sleep every night. Don't you hear Hop Hop yodel himself to sleep every night? <gasps> I thought it was a stray animal or something. Nope, just our hot pot being a freak. You're a freak. Number 105, Mother of Olms. This episode is the definition of so dumb that it's enjoyable. The plot is really gross, but it's so out there that I kind of appreciate it, especially with Sasha whining every minute or so. Sasha? But it's gross and I don't wanna. However, it doesn't change the fact that this episode is disgustingly pointless. If it weren't for the prophecy stated at the end of the episode that we've been dying to hear. Number 104, Breakout Star. I feel like this episode's plot is not really all that significant in the grander scheme of things. And getting pimples and all of a sudden receiving a lot of love and with the episode ending with all of that reset for future episodes is really predictable. Also, this episode doesn't have a strong climax. It has two climaxes, but none of them are complementary, so I think this episode is overall just a bit of a mess. 
Number 103, Kontaji Ann. I feel like this is a jarring shift in Ann's character because in the previous episode, she was really willing to challenge herself to get herself in a lot of tough situations because she fears that she's being treated like a soft person. And she wants to prove that she's just like the rest of the planters. But in this episode, she slacks off. She doesn't want to help the planters in this extreme task, so she pretends to have an illness. Sprig said that the task would be much easier if Anne were involved. That is a pretty weird detour from the character path that Anne has taken up until this episode, especially when Anne's not putting away her facade as the episode goes. While I do appreciate that Anne puts in the work to redeem her mistakes of not helping them on the rainy day, again, it's something that I don't expect Anne to act on, especially after an episode that makes us realize that she's indeed a part of the planter family. You can argue that it's a character flaw and it's okay for a 13-year-old person to be imperfect but it doesn't make this episode more enjoyable. Plus the reveal that the planter's sickness is not harmful after all is just a really weak pull at the end of the episode. It makes the emotional climax at the end seem so manufactured. Some of you might put this episode a lot higher but I'm sorry I just cannot enjoy it as much as I want to. This episode has potential but I think it could have been done a lot better. And that's pretty much it for the snoozer section of the list. Many of the Episodes after this are just average. I'm working on time. Number 102, Girl Time. I appreciate an episode about Anne and Polly hanging out, but I think this episode is missing something. Perhaps it's the part where Polly actually wants to hang out with Anne? And yeah, I know that's the entire conflict of the episode, but the entire thing is resolved by a freaking spitting contest of all things. It was a bit underwhelming in my opinion. Number 101, Family Fishing Trip. This one is kinda whatever, another sprig rated episode on the list, I'm never really into Hop Up and Sylvia's relationship either so I can't say I'm too invested. Although we do see Pollywog Sprig for the first time and it was like the most adorable thing ever. Number 100, Total Redemption. It's an okay episode that gives spotlight to Toadstool for once but nothing much outside of that. Number 99, Newts and Tides. While I do like Tritonius' return to the series, I don't find this episode all that special, even compared to the other season 3 episodes. I don't know, with it being one of the last fun episodes before the finale, I expected something more grand in scale. Also, I loathe this boy so much, my god, can someone kick him? Thank you. Number 98, Grubhog Day. More average amphibia affair, nothing much to note here because the Grubhog event is not pivotal to anything happening afterwards. Number 97, Sprig vs Hop Up. I like the feud between Sprig and Hop Up, but in the end, Hop Up just referred it back to the way he acted in the beginning of the episode, ignoring suggestions. Perhaps that's a critique on how the government doesn't really care about our own aspirations, but that might be too far-fetched. Number 96, Hop Up and Lock. Again, not really crazy about Hop Up and Sylvia's dynamic all that much. I love how this blue frog is said to be Hop Up's long rival but only appears in one episode. Okay, not really, but you know what I mean. Also, can we have more British Polly? May I have this dance, madame? Number 95, The Big Buck Ball Game. This is a pretty okay episode. I like the team of trust and teamwork here. Also, this episode introduces the most hilarious character in this show, period. I grow tulips. Good to know. Number 94, Lil Frog Town. Not one of the more standout episodes in season 2 for me. I feel like the detective trope is just played to death at this point. However, I do like the subplot of Anne just losing her mind while queuing. Oh yeah, like you're really gonna tase a kid. <laughs> Number 93, Ant Theft Auto. This episode is mostly average amphibious stuff. I like the part where Sprig says that, well, we shouldn't have done that just as the episode starts. And this episode also has this iconic, hilarious ending scene. I don't feel safe. Number 92, Children of the Spore. I really like the spooky concept of the episode, but it feels so misplaced because it's put side by side with the other light-hearted episodes. If this were a side story in the shut-in, I would like it more. Also, this episode is responsible for dozens of Spore fan arts across the board, which are so creepy that they're like up there with Darcy fan arts. 
Number 91, The Ballad of Hapadaya Planter. This is a nice breeder that let us know for the first time what a town outside of Wordwood looks like. Hop up trying to stand up for once is also cool to see. Number 90, The Domino Effect. This place is higher than some of the episodes here because it has a cat. I love cats. They're fluffy, elegant, and the rulers of the multiverse. Although I have no idea why that creature looked like Domino in the first place. Is this just a coincidence or is the world of Amphibia really connected to Earth in this way? It is pretty interesting to think about. Number 89, Crook and Punishment. It's cute how Sprig is really into the bad cop role in this episode in order to retrieve his gift to Ivy, but I think this is another case of a Sprig rated episode. Don't get me wrong, I usually love of Sprig. And not to say a Sprig rated episode is automatically bad, I understand that Sprig is just a child and all, but I think he should at least reflect on the things he has done or will do. Number 88, Hoplock. I don't really vibe with the ending of the episode. It seems like they're trying to nail down the moral of the episode in an unsatisfactory way. But it holds a special place in my heart because prior to watching this episode for the first time, I was more of a casual watcher of the show. The essence of the show still didn't quite click with me yet. But then, this scene happened. Oh, oh, maybe we should put pineapple on it. Seems like a natural fit. Don't you dare talk about pineapple on pizza ever. This scene makes me chuckle every time I see it. <laughs> it is so random. And this is why I like Amphibia humor a lot. It's as wild as the show gets. So congratulations, Hoplock, for hooking me into the show. You've made my life a lot better. And that concludes the all right section of the list. Now we're getting to the episodes that I think are... Number 87, Kane Crazy. Is this the best episode in season 1? Absolutely not. But it's always nostalgic to watch one of the earlier episodes that also strengthened Anne's relationship with the planters. We met Loggles for the first time as well. Also Anne engaging in NFTs? No way. Click. Or you could do that. Number 86, Taking Charge. I love the concept of them reenacting the show that they watched for the episode's conflict. It's cute. And no, I'm not making an Among Us joke. Nope. 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 Not gonna do it. Number 85, Adventures in Cat Sitting. I love how Anne looks much more traumatized after the trip to the dentist than she was from Amphibia. But my favorite scene is this one. Everybody up! There's a fire! But I'm still waiting for my order. This swarm is good, but is it worth your life, Karen? My name's Emily, but point taken. Oh, and also that massive foreshadowing in the end. That is probably one of the most clever foreshadowings in the entire show. Number 84, Civil War. I find the premise of the episode hilarious and is basically the show making fun of ship wars that you can find often in pretty much big fandoms. And this episode is also basically a massive flex because many Amphibia fans are so respectful of the most popular ships in the fandom. Number 83, Trip to the Archives. I like the majority of the episode, especially the part where Anne got stuck in that hole as well as Brick diving his way through the drainage system. But I feel like this episode is a missed opportunity to explore more plot elements about the show, maybe something about mythical creatures, the history of Amphibia, or something else that will be significant later on. Number 82, Truck Stop Polly. At first, I wasn't hot into this episode, but I've grown to realize how vulnerable Polly is here. It's a rare instance where the other planter members are sick of Polly causing trouble for them throughout the trip. I love her chat with the truck guys, it gives room for her to reflect on things she's done. I think this is one of the most effective examples in writing Polly other than just a simple comic relief. Number 81, Quarrelers Pass. This episode was mostly remembered by this scene. So do you have a boyfriend back home? Ow! Although my favorite scene has to be where Anne gives Sprig her phone only to realize she can't call him back. I also love Sprig and Polly's conflict and how they managed to reconcile. But this wouldn't be an important episode to the plot if it weren't for the Olm's first appearance. Number 80, Anne Hunter. Let's be honest, the dance scene is what gets this episode this high. 
what a masterpiece. Number 79, Old Town Road. This is a world building episode that I was really dying for on this part of the show. I just love the Olm designs, maybe it's my favorite amphibian design in the entire show. But I think the best part of the episode is the parallels between the two Olm siblings and Sasha. The compassion she has for them reminds me of her era with Percy and Braddock. So happy I could see the day Sasha said this. Hey. I know what it's like to make a huge mistake you regret. I'm still fighting to make up for it. And I hope you won't give up either. However, this episode suffers from a severe lack of humor which on one hand could work with a higher stake but I think it's a missed opportunity to not lighten the mood, especially with some of the brand new characters being introduced. This makes this episode slightly less memorable and it's weird because humor has been an integral part of the show. Really my biggest disappointment with this episode is that they didn't actually include the song Old Town Road here. Such a shame. Number 70 a night at the inn. I don't know why but I always feel cozy whenever I watch this episode. Yeah, it is supposed to be scary but it makes me want to stay at a small inn on a rainy night minus the cannibalism part. Also this episode has one of my favorite lines from Anne. Number 77, Hop Popular. I think this is a nice little encounter between Hop Pop and Toadstool. I know Hop Pop's not gonna replace him, but it's so cool to see him stand up. Okay, Ian, that's enough. Number 76, Mr. X. I love Mr. X's character here. He just has so much charisma, but I think the climax of the episode is cut really abruptly and feels rushed. Even though it's cute that Anne's parents are the heroes of the day for once. It does feel that way but it also does set the tone for Mr. X as the threat of the season's first half. Number 75, Fight or Flight. Just like Newts and Tides, there isn't a whole lot to this episode. I guess this episode is cute while it's on, I didn't expect Domino 2 to return at this point in the series and also the cat invasion on the townies. I also like the additional touch of the music Sprig played on Fiddle Me This in one of the action scenes here as well, that was nice stuff. Number 74, Planter's Last Stand. The spotlight of this episode is the message on how we should put honesty above all else when it comes to marketing, no matter how desperate you are for the profits. It's a very endearing message even though the result of it doesn't end well for the planters. Number 73, Hollywood Hop Pop. I think this is a pretty cool ribbon to tie up the entire Hop Pop getting into a play narrative. Also, Mr. X is here as well, so I guess this bumps this episode up a few places. Number 72, Handy Anne. I love how Anne is really willing to guard the planter's house because they have done so much for her. It really effectively teases the whole Super Saiyan thing later on in the show as well. Also, hell yeah, more Chuck screen time. I grow tulips. Number 71, Friend or Frobo. I like Polly's story here of learning to be responsible to Frobo. I think finding a companion to talk to makes for a much deserved arc for Polly. Polly is acting more caring than usual and it's such a turn from her usual bloodthirsty attitude. I really like it. Number 70, Thai Feud. Another example of a Sprig rated episode. I feel like Sprig goes at an unnecessary length to be accepted in the Boontree family and him trying to destroy Ned's food truck without thinking about the havoc it will wreak is a little overboard. But I still respect his motivation to do all all of those, I see this episode as Sprig's version of Ant vs Wild and I like that parallel. Number 69, After the Rain. I was pretty underwhelmed by this episode when I first watched it and I think I still am. Part of me thinks that this episode really slows down in the middle and the start. They don't do the pacing any favors. Plus, Ant goes from being really upset to forgiving in such a short time that I almost didn't buy it. I did find Hop Up still tragic even though this climax could have been constructed better. Luckily, this episode has grown on me a little bit because apparently that wasn't the end of the Calamity Box conflict between Ann and Hop Up. It is still debatable in the very next episode and I like that. It would be very awkward if it just ended here. Number 68, Spider Sprig. Oh boy, some of you are not gonna like this placement of this episode here. If Amphibia adopted a kid cosmic episode, 
episode, this would be it. This episode also has grown on me a bit for how fun it is as a standalone episode and as an homage to the Spider-Man franchise. I also love Molly Joe's design, it reminds me of Rika from Wonder Egg Priority. But as an episode that airs right before Olivia and Yunnan, yeah, it may feel a bit out of place. Even though I get the entire point of balancing the more lighthearted stuff and the heavier stuff. And that's the end of the decent section. Now we're getting to the good stuff. Number 67, Bessie and Microangelo. I like the two snails story well enough, it's cute, but I think the highlight goes to the scene where Anne admits she's already happy with her look after all this time. She doesn't want to be anything she's not, and considering her past with Sasha, I'd say that's a really nice progression. Good cue for us to not skip this episode, Matt. Number 66, Lily Pad Thai. I really enjoyed the Thai representation here. Also, it shows how dedicated Anne is to help someone in need. This is a pretty important stepping stone in Anne's character progression throughout the season. Number 65, A Caravan Named Desire. This is yet another pleasant episode to watch. I like how Hop Pop's acting here is being used for a larger part in True Colors. That tooth play flashback is probably the funniest flashback in the series as well. Number 64, Anne vs Wild. I like that Anne feels like she's left out from the planters, so she decides to push herself outside the comfort zone, and as a result, Anne reveals the calamity box. The ending scene was really unsettling for the first time I watched it because I knew there was some mystery being shrouded somewhere else behind the light-hearted tone that the show has offered thus far. Number 63, Snow Day. This is an episode that doesn't get enough rep for being another mark on Anne's character development of proving herself as a helpful protector, even if she's not perfect at doing it. Also, watching this episode made me wonder, does everyone in Ophibia like the newts and toads freeze as well when the temperature drops? I mean, there's the weasel that is able to snatch the world with people from underground, so if there are more weasels or creatures like that spread throughout Amphibia, that would have been some AFK type of stuff. So I don't know, this is fiction, why am I acting like a Mr. Know-it-all? I'm not a nitpicker. Number 62, Sprig Gets Schooled. This is a nice continuation from fiddle me this with Sprig finally getting accepted to Newtopia University. This is one of the examples that even though an episode might seem like an individual piece, it actually connects in some way later on in the series whether you realize it or not. Number 61, The Planters Check-In. The first time we meet King Andreas and every second of it is gold. <laughs> Oh, and the rest of the episode is pretty cool, I guess. I wish we could have had more screen time for Bella because she's really cute, but oh well, the short time she lasts on this show is worth it. Number 60, Fight at the Museum. I love the inclusion of Dr. Jan in this season. Not only is she reminding me of Marcy with its quirkiness, but also she's pretty caring and gentle to Anne as well, as she advises Anne to sleep once in this episode. Also, I think I've lost all respect to Hop Pop. Wait. Your people think the world is round? Number 59, Night Drivers. This episode mostly functions as a bridge to return to Wordwood, but it stands out as one of the creepiest looking amphibia episodes. I would say this is even scarier than the shot in. Like damn, I've never seen shots this intentionally creepy and shivering in the rest of the show. I mess with it. Number 58, Family Shrub. It has some unexpectedly fluid animation, probably one of the most well animated episodes in the bunch and also I like that each of the planters are able to solve separate riddles in the underground passage. It gives an impression that every planter, and included, inherits a special skill from the planters preceding them. That means so much more when we get to know the story behind Leaf 2. Number 57, Hop Till You Drop. This one is so chaotic, it's really what you expect from Amphibia up until this point but in a much different and refreshing setting. Also, also, I can't believe we live in a timeline where green hop-up is canon. The only sensible theory is that Matt actually saw Salty DK Dance past tweets and said, Yep, we need to include this fella before the show ends. Number 56, Sasha's Angels. This is a 
cool little episode that brings the focus back on the townies. Toadie's transition to a madman is pretty fun to watch and just shows how much this invasion has impacted many of the characters in the land. We also get some character moments from Sasha and Anne, a nice throwback to some season 1 stuff, and also a reinforcement of the apocalyptic setting in this stage of the show. Number 55, The Root of Evil. This is one of those amphibia episodes that I just love purely because it continues the story from season 1. In this case, it's the spores. Really, this is why many season 1 episodes are not worthless and skippable. The soundtrack to this episode is also killer. This is a regular, enjoyable amphibia episode that I like no more, no less. Also, people have been saying that this episode referenced Midsommar. I can't really comment because I haven't seen that movie yet. Number 54, if you give a frog a cookie. I really like Terry's debut here and it's interesting to know more about the effects that Earth people felt when Anne opened the Calamity Box. I don't really have issues with this episode, it's just a bit milder compared to my faves in season 3. Number 53, Fixing Frobo. I'm surprisingly kinda into this one. I really like seeing Polly doing everything she can for someone who she loves. It's kind of new for her. I'm very much rooting for their friendship now. Jess and Ellie are also cool additions to the series. Glad to see them getting nominated for an award. I also like this little detail on how delayed Zoom connections can be in the scene. Number 52, Bizarre Bazaar. This is pretty high on the list, not only because it's one of the most plot relevant episodes in season 1 with Valeriana and the Calamity Boss being buried, but also it's pretty interesting to see a concept of a secret night market in this world we haven't known much about. Also, there are some memorable lines here. Tongue him? I hardly know him! Have you killed a man, Hop Pop? Number 51, Flood, Sweat, and Tears. This is the first real fight between Anne and Sprig, and I like how it describes how one friendship that's too close can bring negative effects. They need to learn to respect each other's boundaries. And the combo moves in the end? Hell yeah, that, that's amazing, that's amazing. Number 50, Turning Point. As an episode about Sasha's character, this is a great and pivotal one. I just really love seeing Sasha finally realizing how she has messed up and has broken her friendship with Anne. So she tries to make up for that by creating a resistance against Andreas. Unfortunately, the fight in this episode comes way too late. They beat the robots like it's nothing. While the fight doesn't leave too much impact for me, this episode still succeeds at convincing the audience to root for Sasha. Number 49, Swamp and Sensibility. Even I did not expect Wally to be a part of a rich family. That is probably the most gut-busting twist in the series. And you know, it's just charming to see Anne interacting with Wally once again. There's also this commentating frog who sounds and looks just like Kermit. Oh, wait a minute. Number 48, Cursed. This is one of the plenty episodes in this list that I have a frog girl bias with. In this case, it's Maddie who really steals this episode. Before this, I didn't think too much of her besides, hmm, is she basically the show's panini and chowder but a god? Well, curse proved my dumb assumptions wrong because she absolutely kicks ass. Honestly, I'm happy that she and Sprig ended up as just friends instead of her being completely obsessed over him, potentially losing personalities in the process. There are also the cursed forms of Anne and Sprig which are pretty funny. Number 47, Lost in Utopia. I just love it when Anne does some random hijinks. And this episode really nails the Utopia world building very well. The street markets, the tail stores, the parades. It's so fun and I see this just like the girl time episode but in a much different location and a lot crazier. Number 46, Dating Season. This episode shouldn't be this high but man, I'd be lying if I said that I didn't have a massive truckload of Ivy by here. I mean, this is the first episode she's in, the debut of the one and only frog that makes my day every time I think of her. She is the definition of a being that should be protected at all costs. And man, this episode straight away sold me on the relationship between Sprig and Ivy. I'm absolutely glad that they insisted they were just friends at first, but of course, Anne being a shipper herself trying to make the love blossom between those two. And of course, that didn't go well at all 
in fact a formal dance is really awkward for both of them. The pond scene is maybe the pivotal moment where Sprig finally has feelings for Ivy, no pressure from everyone else, it's just natural between the two of them. Oh man oh man oh man, I love Sprivy so much I can't even explain why, I just love them. Number 45, The New Normal I adore how Anne introduces the planters to her parents and how they explore the earth environment by going to the supermarket and just experience the usual amphibia craziness in it. It's gratifying to see Anne proving that she's responsible to the planters. If there's one thing I'd knock this episode down for, it's the first leg. Most, if not all of it, is spoiled by the trailers, promos, and sneak peeks. But other than that, as a first taste of what an amphibia episode on earth feels like, it's not bad. Number 44, Combat Camp I picture this episode as an important moment where Anne finally learns how to wield a sword and has her first actual proper battle with someone else. No, the battle against the Toots doesn't count because she used a freaking racket. I like how this episode is aired alongside Bug Ball. On Bug Ball, Anne learns about trusting another, but in this episode they took the big riding on Journal 3. I like that contrast. Also, I love that her encounter against Tritonio mirrors the entire Anne-Sasha conflict in Season 2. Both of them used Anne to achieve their goals and Anne beats them in the end with the sword fight. Number 43, Grime's People Grime and Sprig working their differences is a really entertaining and cute thing to enjoy in this episode. And I'm just gonna say it now, their dynamic and characters in this episode are parallels to Sonic and Knuckles in the Sonic 2 movie. Think about it. Not only because Sprig is usually the optimistic and childish one and Grimes the grumpy and tough one, but also Sprig is very agile on his attacks while Grimes' true power lies in physical strength. Considering Matt is a big fan of the Sonic franchise, these similarities aren't surprising at all. And that wraps up this chapter of the list. Now before I move on, since we're halfway done, I want to clarify something. Yes, I might have put a lot of season 1 episodes at the bottom half of the list, and look, they're mostly enjoyable. The magic about Amphibia's first season is that whether you only pick a random episode or you binge watch through all of them in order, you can still be entertained. It's just a matter of taste because often new watchers will tune out a few episodes in because they feel bored. And I don't blame them, it's a slow season, it's intended that way. I firmly believe that before we know more about the plot elements, we have to be invested in the characters when we were first introduced to the show. That is the priority, at least with a show of this type. And by characters, I don't mean only Anne and the planters, or just Sasha and Marcy, but also the townspeople and the other minor characters too. They give the world of Amphibia so much more spirit and charm. It makes the show livelier. If you are looking for more plot than the characters, you are missing a part of what makes this show special. Sure, some of the carefree episodes maybe are just okay, but again, they are important for hooking us into the show. It may not work for some people, but it does work for me. And trust me, if you're patient enough to get through the first season, you will be rewarded. Well, now that's done, let's continue shall we? Number 42, Ivy on the run. Ivy being the main character of an amphibia episode is just everything I was really anticipating and lo and behold, I got it and it's pretty fun. I like that we get bits of character moments from her mom as well who apparently has traveled far and wide this entire time. It's just a pretty cool duality between the rebellious daughter and the tidy looking mother. Number 41, The Three Armies. This is a pleasant episode about Anne and Sasha trying to get the three factions of Amphibia to get along together. I guess you can call this the last fun episode of the show since everything onwards is just different shades of dire. I don't have much else to say about this episode other than this amazing promo art for the episode by Ferocia. Speaking of that, I feel like it's the right time to talk about the promo arts that the crew make every time a new episode drops. They're just so good and also versatile, ranging from a silly deep fried meme to an actual animatic. Not gonna lie, I'm gonna miss the time when the crew will just tease a new episode with promo arts. Good times. Number 40, Commander Ann. Hey guys, wanna hear a funny joke? Nah, I'm just here for the ranking, but sure I guess. Did you guys know that in this episode, Sasha is revealed to be attracted to women? <laughs>
Nah, but seriously, this episode works really well as a Sasha and Anne reunion after all the mess happened in True Colors. Just like Turning Point, the pacing of this episode is all over the place, but thankfully it's easily made up by just Anne and Sasha having a satisfying dynamic that I expect. You really have to admire how Sasha has changed a lot since we last saw her, not only behavior-wise but physically as well. She's been working really hard to protect the world with people and creating this banner. She realized her consequences and she doesn't lie when she says she wants to be better. I just love this development so much. Number 39, Anne's Terminator. This one is basically an elongated chase and fight scene. I like how tense it is. It's also said how Anne has to finally tell the truth by going through the hard way even though she has good intentions. Poor Mrs. Boon Choi, I can't imagine how she must have felt during those dreadful 5 months. I guess making Anne clones is the most ideal Wait a minute. Number 38, Fort in the Road. It's really cool to explore some ancient artifacts facts that are never touched before in the show. This is pretty much the first expanded world building in the show with computers and robot factories and stuff. Many times this episode makes me chuckle a lot. That <laughs> wasn't so bad. Number 37, The Shut In. This is a really fun Halloween special that is apparently not canon, which is not surprising because having Anne living in a world with the frogs as their fictional human counterparts being animated sounds like it's coming from a Wattpad fanfic that wants to ship Anne and Sprig together. Ugh. That's not a diss on the segment though, it's actually a really funny take on how negativity can really affect people, especially on the internet. Toffee from Star Vs also made a cool comeback by cutting Hop Pop's uncharacteristically shiny hair off. But holy hell, I'm addressing another Sprivey plot. Perhaps this is why I group these Ivy episodes together in a bunch so I can express my love and admiration of her in a short period of time so that I can free my mind off of her in future episodes in the list. My genius. It's sometimes frightening. Anyways, another Sprivey moment, another moment of me screeching in my pillow because of how adorable Ivy with her hair down is. Number 36, New Wartwood. This is a really fun episode. I just wish people would actually watch the rest of it instead of just obsessing over this scene. Uh, I'm just joking, but you know, there is a of truth to it. But I do appreciate the scene more since it shows that Anne does listen to Marcy's rambling more than she did back on Earth. And yeah, have I said that I love Marcy's quirk in the show? Well, this episode showcases that in its fullest. Hello! You know, as messed up as her actions can be, I will always adore Marcy's soft side a lot. The Lord will always have Marcy on our souls. And then I will definitely burn in hell for this next pick. Number 35, Sprivey. Yeah, the episode title speaks for itself. Sprig and Ivy are just so in love and supportive to one another. They are the definition of cringe and while many of you guys are turned off by it, I don't care. I love them so much. This is one of the last purely light-hearted episodes we're ever gonna get here and what better way to do it than focusing on the cutest couple in the show. Part of me was bummed that we didn't have an episode centered around Ivy and Sasha this season but as someone who has rooted for Sprivey since dating season, it's just really fun to see them having their last dance. Literally. Number 34, A Day at the Aquarium. This is such a fun and charming tribute to season 1, whether it be explicit mentions or just callbacks in the form of action scenes. In the end, Marcy's decision to let Anne go with the planters is a really sad turning point for Marcy's character arc as she wants Anne to have fun with the family she makes in this world, unlike herself who ran away from her family to escape here. And pause here. I personally think this is one of the best shots in the series, like the shadow, the sun sinking down. I feel like it'll be better if Marcy's cape wishes a bit slower, but it's still a really pretty shot. Number 23, Return to Wartwood. What a return it is. As someone who generally enjoys season 1, consider myself invoked with nostalgia. Having all the Wartwood people to get involved in the fight against a monster is just the best way to go back to basics. 
6, the fact that they have to call on a dangerous monster to bring them their gifts is just downright ridiculous. Also, I get to talk about Ivy for the third time in the space of 6 episodes in this list. Hell yeah, I'm on a roll. I think the ending scene is the funniest part, like they can condense so much of these into these 10 golden seconds. <gasps> Number 32, N or Beast. Ah, yes, where it all began. When I watched the plot a few days after it premiered, just like many others, I was less of a fan and more like an intrigued person. The one who goes like, Hmm, okay, this is interesting. I need to watch more episodes so that I might know more about the plot. Fast forward to 2022, watching this again as a big fan, everything feels so ancient. All this stuff about Sprig meeting Anne for the first time, Anne fighting her first monster, her eyes going blue in a supremely subtle way, it's just an amazing nostalgia to have. I wish I could go back to a time where the fandom wasn't that huge and I could enjoy this show with just a small group of people. But at the same time, I'm glad that I can enjoy Amphibia with all of you. It's the sense of companionship that makes this show more compelling. Number 31, Best Fronts. Just like Anne or Beast, this episode feels really nostalgic. Anne was still trying to adjust with Sprig, Hop Up and Polly were still skeptical of Anne, we got a first glimpse of Sasha, man, good old times. Seeing Anne hanging out with Sprig for the first time is a wonderful moment because this sets the foundation for the friendship these two are gonna sustain for the remainder of the show. And it is a really good introduction to the main themes of the show, with the episode touching down on what Anne initially thought what healthy friendships looked like. Number 30, Froggy Little Christmas. This Christmas special almost feels like a recap of season 3 with many of the Earth characters coming back once again before we're treated to the final leg of the show. I love that the planters are constantly asking questions about the true meaning of Christmas, but all in all, it's really nice to see Anne giving her mom an entire parade that she has dreamt of. I think this is my favorite scene in this episode because of how dumb it is. And that's a fact. So yeah, in a nutshell, it's fun and it makes me want to sip a glass of hot chocolate every night. Number 29, Stakeout. I cannot emphasize how important this episode is for the planters. Anne and Hop Up has such different views on things and it's nice to see both of them get along together for once. The best part is of course the fight scene where Anne and Hop Up went through hallucination and had all the superpowers and stuff. Also shout out to the crew for taking Anne's design in this episode and the better design if you can call it that, in making the Super Saiyan. I should have known that this Anne is foreshadowing something big later in the show. Number 28, Wax Museum. What a wonderful Gravity Falls tribute. It's always a treat to have more Grunkle Stan, even in the form of a frog since many of us have fond memories of the classic Disney show. It's always amazing to have cameo episodes like this in your show and bonus points for also connecting the episode to a larger narrative as well as we get hints of Earth objects Jack's getting thrown into this world as well. I don't have much else to say, this is just a good, solid crossover episode. Number 27, Maddie and Marcy. Both of them starring in an episode together is a match made in heaven. I really enjoy watching Maddie having to take care of her sisters and the struggles that come with it. She just wants someone that is interested in her own hobbies, and that's when she finds Marcy. They just have great chemistry with each other that I can't get enough of. Power Duo episodes are always my personal favorites in the show. Also, I find Maddie's sister's deep auto-tuned voices to be hilarious. Wow, we're big. Maybe a little too big? Hey, uh, guys? How much big are we supposed to get? Travis Scott, eat your heart out. Number 26, Temple Frogs. I really love the incorporation of Thai culture in this episode. It's just fun to see them adjusting to the culture so well and how kind they're portrayed here. I mean, the Thai people there supported the Boon Chui family when their daughter was gone. It's kind of moving. Also, this episode has the best frame in the entire season 3. <gasps> Guys, your disguises, they've fallen off. Oh, my God.
Number 25, Scavenger Hunt. Not to sound like a Marcan shipper, but Anne trying her best to outsmart Marcy in this episode is just so cute to me. The Utopian people are also really kind and I really want to meet them. I love the message of being proud of who you are and your strengths. Also, you gotta accept that everyone has their own flaws. Trust me, in a university where other students get so competitive academically, I relate heavily to that message. Number 24, Sprig's Birthday. As someone who has been really invested in the Anne Sprig dynamic since the show started, I'll call this episode a victory lap. Seeing Anne willing to risk it all to give her best bud a fantastic birthday is adorable. I love the action scene in the hot air balloon and how it affects random people on the ground. <laughs> No, Tyler, I will not clown face you. Number 23, Escape to Amphibia. If Froggy Little Christmas is the recap of Season 3A, Escape to Amphibia is the final adventure. I'm saying that because every Earth character is here. Terry, Jess, Allie, Dr. Jan, Humphrey, even Molly Joe. I just love their chemistry with each other, like how Jan and Terry really take their time to steal a generator from a freaking FBI headquarter. Speaking of the FBI, this episode is where Mr. X shines the most. He is genuinely threatening but also still fun to watch. I also find the story of Anne not being able to let go of her parents pretty heartfelt. She's just reuniting with them and part of her doesn't want to leave them again. Also, I cannot talk about this episode without mentioning the reference to the dark Vader scene in Rogue One. They absolutely blew me away when I first watched it. They recreated the scene masterfully from the beginning till the end. Hands down, one of the best scenes in the show. I'm not even exaggerating. Number 22, Toad Catcher. Oh boy, do I enjoy Sasha and Grimes' contrasting perspectives after the events of Reunion. I don't think I will ever hate Grime as Sasha's closest companion that always gives her advice. He's kind of like the master of his student in this episode. Also, the most entertaining character of the show is also introduced here. See, you have decided to submit to the great General Yunan! No, I don't like JoJo. And we finally reached the end of this section of the list. Before we continue, I'd like to go on another little detour. So it's not a surprise that Sasha really likes to take control of people, right? She likes to be their leader, regardless of how they think of her. But Reunion has given Sasha food for thought that her behavior is only going to crumble her friendship with Anne. So given the events on the Toad Tower, you'd expect her to let go of her past toxic behavior, right? But in Toad Catcher, she decides that she wants to rule the entire amphibia. Her temptation to rule over people just got worse. She won't accept the fact that she can't have control over things all the time. Now, we know that the three girls, Anne, Sasha, and Marcy, go through their own personal arcs in Amphibia, right? Each of them has a distinct problem of their own, but there's something that ties all of their issues together. They won't accept change. And this is why change itself becomes the central theme for the show. Changing someone isn't as simple as singing them a song about change or something like that. That is not a relatable angle if you ask me. Going through a change is complicated because we need to accept things that might seem hard to swallow. The girls are not transported to Amphibia just for fun, but for changing who they really are. They need to improve upon themselves before perfecting their friendship with others. I'm calling this method frog conversion. Each of the girls go through this conversion in, again, different ways. And that is no more apparent than most of the episodes yet to come out on this list. So. Here we go. Number 21, The Core and the King. I really like how serious the tone of this flashback episode is. It's pretty unnatural that you see a lack of jokes in an Amphibia episode before, but this works since this episode's purpose is to give us more background on how the heck the show's conflict even started, rooting from Andrew's words about his past and true colors. The pacing is well balanced, unlike a handful of episodes in season 3, I can digest the story told in the flashback and quickly make connections to other episodes 
episodes fairly easily. God, I just love the parallels between the divorce trio, as the fandom likes to call it, and the calamity trio. Also the scene where Leaf has a vision after opening the calamity box? Stunning. The exchange between Darcy and Andreas is really fun but also shivering considering the episode's central theme of letting go of someone's past. Both of them are attempting to let go of the demons of their past and I like that commonality a lot. Number 20, the sleepover to end all sleepovers. This episode is so fun. Marcy and Anne are the best together here. We also get a peek on the activity the girls usually do back on earth with Sasha always dominating the sleepover challenge. I like the little things that are teased in future episodes like the ghost creatures, the moss man, and this frame of the divorce trio. Number 19, the beginning of the end. The flashback at the start of this episode tells a lot about how one-sided a friendship group can be. I think this is the true villain origin story of Darcy. Then it may seem surprising to a lot of people including me that Anne and Sasha didn't mention Marcy very often after True Colors. But it turns out that they've been constantly thinking about those mistakes Marcy has made. They just didn't really know how to express them since it was a massive stab in the back. And when they finally do, Anne thinks that they should still try to forgive Marcy. But Sasha still doubts it, which is reasonable, you know, Sasha is still a child that is still improving on her past behavior. Also, it's not like Sasha doesn't deserve to be angry. I agree with what Sasha says that Marcy's action is messed up. This is a complicated process and reconciliation but I like that Anne is confident that they should try to repair their friendship. As a symbol of heart, it's her job to make sure to fix a broken friendship. And then there's this cool dance battle sequence that no, I'm not gonna reference that again. And finally, the girls confront Darcy for the first time. I don't have a super deep character analysis on this scene, it's just so eerie both visually and tonally. Darcy is just an unmitigated sicko villain like I expected. I love it, even though they didn't get too much screen time in the series. So yeah, this episode is just a good way to kickstart the series finale. Number 18, The Second Temple. Okay, so the next few episodes will basically be the temple episodes. I bunched them all together because all of them are great in their own way. In the case of the second temple, I still vividly remember how frustrated I was with the ending. But then I realized, oh what do you know, that is probably the best mistake Anne's ever made. Other than that, this is a well written and genius concept of the second temple to execute an important phase in Anne's frog conversion. Anne is the heart of the trio and she has to hone it to keep the bond of their friendship alive. It's safe to say that Anne's character journey throughout the show thus far has paid off at this point in time. Number 17, The First Temple. This 22 minute long episode has the most character moments for Marcy before she went through a metamorph. And what a way to truly boost the second half of season 2 which I still think has some of the show's best episodes bunched up together. The episode is able to use its long runtime to have two main conflicts, Marcy being in her zone a bit too much and Anne and Hop Pop working out their differences. And I enjoy both of them, we learn more about the problems Marcy has that can really endanger others as she puts her own efforts into priority. Marcy is the wit of the trio and she has to hone it to solve every problem that comes in their way. Meanwhile, Hop Up still feels guilty after the events of After the Raid. Things get pretty heated between him and Anne as they continue to reconcile. It was pretty heartfelt in the end. Number 16, The Third Temple. I still remember how the fanbase went a bit unhinged when these three girls met for the first time again after being transported to Amphibia. And what a reunion it was. This episode made me really want to see more interactions between Sasha and Marcy. Guess you can say I'm in the Sasha RC cult now. And while it's only done within an episode, it's cute to see Sasha and Anne finally giving each other a second chance, even though only temporarily. Yikes. That's a part of Sasha's character that she still can't let go of. Sasha is the strength of the trio and she has to hone it to invigorate their resolve to face every obstacle that comes in their way. Number 15 
Fiddle me this. It was only natural for someone's parents to want their children to succeed. They urge their kids to work harder and be a little less perfect. This eventually results in their child feeling stressed out and drained. Unfortunately, there are times where the parents just want to squeeze every last bit of our strength to the point where it's less because of the children's dreams and more of their parents' wants. That's pretty much what happened with Hop Up and Sprig in this episode. As someone who likes making videos on this channel, sometimes I feel the pressure for myself to upload more videos. But there are times where I'm just burnt out. I don't want to make these videos because they're long. There is a point where some of us may feel like the hobbies we like to do become more of a chore. But at the end of the day, you should just do things that you like because you like doing them. This episode brilliantly sends this message home, specifically for me. Sprig likes playing violin because he thinks it's fun, not because he wants to win a talent show. And I think this episode also has one of the most emotional episode resolutions in the series. Number 14, End of the Year. And we didn't vote for you because you're flawless. <laughs> far from it. We voted for you because of how far you've come. You've grown so much in your time here, and this town just wouldn't be the same without you. <laughs> what a satisfying conclusion to Anne's character arc of proving that she's accepted in Wartwood. And what an episode to go out on. Anne looks so good in that suit, I wonder if they'll hold a party episode with that outfit with the other girls. Spoiler alert, they don't. The Sprig and Ivy confession is too cute for words, there's a dabbing Anne statue, and that cliffhanger sets the tone for a thrilling season finale. Number 13, Beryl's Warhammer. I always love it when Sasha is being worried and soft-spoken. It shows that she is indeed a kind person, but she still has some ways to go to improve herself. That is shown with the tough pill for her to swallow in the end with her two toad friends abandoning her. This is also a part of Sasha's frog conversion. It's such a disaster that both of them don't even reappear again in the show. This episode speaks so much about Sasha's tendency to lead a friendship that often doesn't go down well. She does does that with her two girlfriends and she does that with the toad couple as well. That's the ongoing character flaw with Sasha. She keeps pushing others to the limits until that boundary is broken. She finally faces the horror of the consequences and so she finally learns her lesson. I haven't said this before but in Commander Anne, I like that Sasha straight away hands over the resistance leadership to Anne. That's how much she regrets her past actions. Number 12, Toad Tax. I think this is the first Amphibia episode that really truly wowed me from the first watch. Anne was still despised by pretty much everyone on Wartwood and she wished she could be given some sort of respect by them. That's when we got introduced by the Toads. Anne actually got along well with them. She finally felt accepted for once. This shows a lot about Anne's strong dependency on others. I really love that this hints at the negative relationship that Anne and Sasha have later on in the season finale. Even after being stranded for a month, she still can grow into her own self, so she decides to always follow the much superior force no matter what world she lives in and no matter what the side effects are. But once she found out the Toad's wrongdoings and that they were about to confiscate Bessie and realized she'd been so desperate for respect that she was walking on the wrong path. This episode made me really root for Anne and made me realize that she is and always has been a compelling character. In the end, she's cheered by the Wartwood people. It's what she'd always wanted. It's just a very satisfying episode overall. Number 11, Olivia and Yunnan. If I'm being honest, I wish they didn't spoil Darcy's reveal at the end of the season 3 trailer because if so, I would not be able to sleep the day I watched that episode for the first time. Still though, it's painful to see the sweet, innocent Marcy getting possessed into someone she shouldn't be. That implanting scene is going down as one of the most haunting scenes in the entire show. And I think this episode does a brilliant job of reeling us into the dramatic ending of the episode. You kinda saw it coming before this episode aired, but it's still really tough to see Andrea's officially turning his back against the girl that he uses for his own sake. Also, I gotta give it up to the voice actors here. What are you doing, Andreas? Stop it, you maniac! That's not to dismiss the rest of the episode, which balances humor and the high stakes of the plot very well. It's not too serious, but it doesn't waste its time playing around either. 
The prime example of this is the fear projector scene. It may tackle each one of the character's fears, but it's not too dark that it'll freak you out. Well, except when Sasha and Anne fused into a corrupted gem, that was creepy. But seriously, I find it devastating that Marcy is the most lovable character in the show but is also the one that gets the most terrifying consequences. She purposefully sends her friends to a fantasy world that she wants to live forever in. Again, it is super messed up. But simultaneously, I feel really bad for her because even on Earth, she often gets third wheeled by Anne and Sasha. This is why among the trio, I relate to Marcy the most because I get the feeling that making friends is hard and you will do anything to keep them forever. Guys, guys, stop fighting. This is crazy. We're supposed to be friends for life. We don't split up. She just can't accept that she can't stay forever with her friends in this world or any other world. And boy, does she go through one hell of a frog conversion. Especially when she is possessed by the collection of amphibious greatest minds. And speaking of that, we have at last arrived at the final part of this long list. Thank you guys so much for still sticking with me up until this point. These are the centerpieces of the show that impress me every time I watch it. Here is the collection of Amphibious Greatest Episodes. Number 10, The Dinner. This is one of the very few Amphibia episodes that has the entirety of the Calamity trio in it. Huh, that was pretty surprising considering people are really obsessed with the three of them. And episodes like this made me understand exactly why. Their interactions are so fun. Especially when you realize that these three have such distinct personalities from one another. It's always interesting to see neighboring worlds collide and create such a compelling friendship. Honestly, if I were to propose an idea for an amphibious spin-off series, I would definitely pick a slice of life type of show with Sasha, Anne, and Marcy just hanging out with each other, skipping school, going through sleepovers, and all that. Anyways, this episode is mainly about Sasha still trying to get along with the planters. I feel bad for her whenever she gets herself in an awkward conversation or every time the planters, especially Sprig, intentionally make her upset, while Sasha herself has made an effort to throw out her weapons to make her less intimidating. But I also like how she admits that she hasn't changed, even though it starts the wildfire that is the true colors conflict. It plays into the theme of change that I mentioned earlier. Sasha still can't pass the frog conversion yet, and that's why their friendship still has cracks in them. Last but not least, Grime is the true underdog in this episode. He just comes out with good lines in every scene he's in. Oh, but beware, their stingers cause paralysis. Number 9, Wally and Anne. This episode is a fantastic character work for Anne, and Wally is a perfect partner for her. Considering he's the first frog that encountered her, and throughout the season up until that point, Anne hasn't been that fond of Wally. What the heck, dude? You ditched me? And now I find you rubbing elbows with a local deadbeat? That hurt my soul. And the pairing from both of them really fits because they are outcasts from many people in Wartwood. But we get to see different points of view from each one of them about being a weirdo. Wally doesn't care about what others think of him and he tells Anne that she can be whoever she wants. That is the main reason why I love this episode. It's message. For most of her life, Anne can decide her own move. She's doubtful of herself. She doesn't want to change who she is. Is. And as a result, she just does whatever Sasha and Marcy tell her to do. But this episode teaches her a lesson that it's okay to be whoever she wants. She can't stay in her comfort zone forever and she has to eventually grow into her own self. Remember this clip from Bessie and Microangelo I pointed out earlier? I think the reason I don't want a new look is because... I'm finally happy with who I see in the mirror right now. This is the point where Anne is finally happy with who she is. Wally plays a really significant role in forming Anne's character. And I feel like he doesn't deserve enough credit for that. Just like how the Wartwood people shrug him off every day. 
I'm worried for people that prefer to skip season 1 just because it doesn't have major plot points because they will miss gems like this. Number 8, Battle of the Bands. This is such a fun episode to conclude season 2 besides, you know, the actual finale. Sasha still can't relinquish her urge to take full control over the band, just like back home. I like that Sasha finally learns from Toadie's advice to just support your friends whenever possible and just have fun. She still does her job on taking over the amphibia throne later on but she doesn't feel all too glorious about it. She feels bad that she won't be able to retrieve all that good time spent with her friends again. Also the songs themselves are so good. I'm tired of picking the best one. Both Heart Stomper and No Big Deal are slappers. Don't mind me jamming this out in the middle of my 100 gigs playlist while I'm driving. Unfortunately this is the last episode before everything about the show really shifts into a new gear and completely shocks us. But my advice? Just enjoy every bit of fun moment while it lasts. We do get the girls performing all together on the stage, which is fun. And that's really what I can say about this episode. Again, it's fun. Not only the episode itself, but my experience with the Amphibia fandom as well. I still remembered all of us really thriving back then. I hung out with plenty of people that just made my time in this community worth spending. Some people wanted Amphibia to get more serious than usual, but for me what's most important is the fun that we all had while watching the show and being active in the fanbase as well. Because what is Amphibia if it's not fun? Number 7 Reunion. I don't think this episode needs a thorough explanation, it's just a stellar climax in Anne's character arc throughout the first season. She has changed from the very first time we met her. She doesn't want to be pushed around by Sasha anymore. In fact, if only she was strong enough back then to refuse Sasha's order, this entire mess would not have happened at all. The conflict between these two is probably the longest running conflict in the entire series. It literally spans all the way till the near the series finale. And this episode does a great job on selling us on their long-term dispute. The moment where Anne defeats Sasha is a really gratifying scene. And the moment where Bill Withers lean on me plays, well, do I need to say more? I think this is just a super solid season finale. There's no reason for this show to not end on a high note for its first outing. Number 6. Prison Break. This is the most fun episode in season 1. I really enjoyed seeing Sasha for the first time. This episode is a perfect introduction to her character. Straight away, you can see the difference between her and Anne. You can see her special ability of convincing others to do what she says. And I always chuckle when Percy speaks and acts or when Grime is being really sinister to these dudes. You know what would lighten this atmosphere a little bit? A joke! How many herons does it take to storm a castle? It is also charming to see how Sasha and Grime are able to work with each other for the first time. This results in a very cute scene where Grime compliments his army for once. There is nothing more satisfying than seeing the Toads being on Grime's side here and him being proud of his squad. It is an excellent episode all around and it sets up what would be a very interesting character arc for Sasha. Number 5 Marcy at the Gates. Just like Prison Break, this episode introduces us to a fan favorite and my personal favorite character. You know who it is. I still remember when people thought Marcy would be a really menacing girl to deal with, looking at some teaser arts. But it turns out she is actually a cinnamon roll. She is a fiction obsessed nerd that really likes to talk about her interests. Now I get why a lot of people kin her. I can't emphasize how important this episode is. It effectively made us love Marcy and root for her. This of course leads to the twist at the end of the season that would not work as well if people people weren't into her character in the first place. Also, what would the show become without the many memorable interactions between Anne and Marcy? I feel like it would be missing something truly cute about it. Yeah, yeah, this episode also spawns the soon emerging Mark and shippers, but again, the fanbase will never be the same without them. It's just an amusing episode with a whole load 
mode of Marcy that I can't get enough of. I love how protective Anne is to Marcy just because she doesn't want to lose her again. It's understandable because back home, Marcy is really accident prone. And in this wild world, anything bad can happen. But sending the girls to another world without their consent aside, Marcy has been putting some effort to put her clumsiness behind her. I've really grown out of here, Anne. Coming to my own, leveled up. No more clumsy, klutzy Marcy. Can you believe it? Your cloak's on fire. What? Yeah, she is still uncoordinated plenty of times, but she records her mistakes in her journal to remind herself next time. Another reason why I'm looking forward to that journal. It's a change from her that is kind of underrated by many people, honestly. I also like how Sprig doesn't trust Marcy at first, only to be saved by her in the end, which also happens once again in True Colors. Parallels like that are one of the many reasons why re-watching the show and examining the little details in each episode are so exciting to do. Overall, a very lovely episode. Episodes like this display how fun Amphibia can be, but a few others show how emotional this show can get with how relatable it is. This episode probably has the most heartfelt sentiment in the series, besides the finale of course. Anne wants to give her mom a gift from another world as not only something to preserve and remember but also a reminder that Anne does learn a lot in this other world and a sign that she misses her parents after all this time. I mean, let's face it, how could you not be touched by it? I like that we have two characters fighting for the exact same goal to give something precious to their parents, Smash Bros style. And giving up the prize to her rival is just a very sweet act to do. And you know, it sometimes doesn't matter if what you give isn't perfect. What matters is whether or not those gifts you bring home will be remembered or neglected after like a couple of months or so. But obviously, it's all about the ending scene. It speaks volumes about how important it is to love your moms. She annoyed me sometimes too. Like, in the kitchen, she'd always sing these goofy Thai love songs, and man was her singing bad. Woof. That woman was beyond tone deaf. That trivial detail that Anne says makes this conversation between her and Sprig really natural and it shows us how much she misses her mom. This scene also makes me really, really sad for Sprig, who doesn't know how it feels to have a real biological parent. And yeah, you can miss someone you don't really know much about. I'm just out of words because the beauty and the emotion of this entire balcony scene speaks for itself. In some ways, I think this episode hits a lot harder now since I moved away from my family to another city. I sometimes wonder how they feel about me. There were times where I was happy that I was all freed from them, but there were times where I really missed their voices to support me or scold me or love me. Okay, Matt, I get it. I'm going to call my parents. Don't tinker with my feelings like that. Let's rumble, girlfriend. This is a 48 minute monster of a penultimate episode. It might not seem fair for me to put this entire thing on number 3 of the list since it's basically 4 times longer than the majority of episodes here, but it feels like a really holistic movie so I can't really split it into 2 parts or more. And yeah, I can already tell by the length itself that this is the most effort that the crew has put into an episode of the show. This is an action packed blow blockbuster with tight pacing and the show extracting every bit of its best aspects. I won't spend too much time analyzing this special because it'll take me all day. So here are 12 reasons why All In is so good. 1. Anne's story in this episode is really compelling as she is finally coming into terms with who she really is. This isn't the first time it's brought up in the series but I feel like her entire character arc is almost wrapped up. Her time in Amphibia changed her perspective from just living the easy life to finally standing on her own and becoming the hero of the world. 
2. Marcy's tale of living her fantasy life inside the chorus illusion is also worth pointing out. Yeah, the whole I wanna return to the old world even though it sucks unlike this fictional world trope is a little cliche. But come on, that's the reason why this show started in the first place and seeing Marcy realizing her mistake is really sweet. She finally completes her frog conversion. Taste the power of photography, you big newt boomer. 3. Every time Darcy spits out a voice line, it wreaks cartoonish evil villain energy that it either makes me wheeze or shiver. Oh, oh, oh. We missed this. <laughs> it's incredible how Hallie Ju can portray two very different characters with the same voice. Would it be much better if they had more screen time in the series? Yes, definitely. But as it stands, Darcy is still a really entertaining evil force to be reckoned with. 4. The Sasha and Darcy fight is incredibly raw. That's the best way I can describe it. The brutality of Darcy wielding a skite brings some huge Spinel vibes. 5. The Anne and Andrews fight is long, yes, but it undergoes plenty of really smooth animation scenes that you can't take your eyes off of. It's interesting how Andrews always has the higher ground over Anne during this fight, but it is Anne's persistence that keeps her in it. 6. The Planters encounter with the herons often goes underappreciated when people discuss this episode. It is just an unforeseen revenge on those creatures who have killed the Sprig and Polly's parents and I love that iconic planter dance in the end. Told you guys it's a masterpiece. 7. Andreas is as charismatic as he's ever been but there is a hint of vulnerability to him that we haven't seen before. Especially when it comes to his loyalty towards the core and it hits hard when he eventually breaks apart emotionally and literally. 8. Leaf's letter is absolutely heart-wrenching. Her soft delivery makes things just... Uh, I can barely describe it. The flashes of the divorce trio and Marcy smiling are necessary touches too and what an important moment it is for Andreas's character. 9. The addition of the Blackpink song into the episode is yes, unexpected, but somehow amazing. I'm just stunned that the crew have the balls to put licensed music in their finale, let alone a K-pop song. Only a show like Amphibia can pull such a boss move like this. 10. Speaking of music, the soundtrack to this episode is stellar too. You can check the full piece in TJ Hill's SoundCloud account. 11. When the girls finally manage to reunite once again, it feels like the conflict between the three of them has reached a fulfilling conclusion. Marcy regrets her actions and all, and they can fight alongside each other again. It takes a long way, but I'm so happy we finally got to this point. 12. The cliffhanger in the end. I mean, it is such an eerie ending with the moon inching ever closer to destroy the entire world. It is so Majora's Mask. So yeah, this episode is the definition of the complete package. It is the main event of the finale, the big boss battle of the show. And it also sets up the things happening in the next episode. As a person, I have a lot of flaws that I'm aware of. And the one thing I really suck at is trying to change. I can't bring myself to be more serious in socializing with other people even though I want to. I can't make myself behave better when I'm faced with a serious problem that comes out of the blue. And in this case, I don't think I can move on from a cartoon show about a human hanging out with frogs. I've been waking up to a new day for the past 3 years or so knowing that I will still have a new Amphibia episode to look forward to, whether it be in a day or months. But as days grow closer before the release of The Hardest Thing, the final episode of the show, I realized that nothing lasts forever. People do need to change sooner or later, whether on a life-changing or trivial scale. The theme of change runs really deep in the show and it's what every character here is going through, whether they like it or not. It is so heartfelt to see the trio say goodbye one more time to their closest companions. Yunan and Olivia adore each other because of Marcy will never be not cute to me. And then there's Andreas whose arc was concluded with him 
finally standing up to his father. Nice reunion parallel by the way. I was worried that the show didn't know what to do with him next, but I like that he wasn't used as a sacrifice merely for us to feel sympathy for him or being redeemed or forgiven by anyone. He is just a castaway now. Marcy's last words to him is just her saying goodbye. And that's fine because things between them have been really rocky and complicated. Sasha and Grimes farewell might look comical on the surface but Sasha wouldn't be the person she is now without Grimes so I also feel sad for them. But really the icing on this teary eyed cake is Anne's parting with the planters. I will really miss all those fun and humorous adventures they have had together especially with Sprig. In this episode, my emotions are just uncontained when Sprig sees Anne lose her life temporarily and when they have to say goodbye to each other. These two are and always have been the true icons of the show and their friendship just means so much to me. Really, I just don't want to see Sprig cry because it shatters my heart into a million pieces. This entire goodbye scene is really hard to watch but Hey, it's the hardest thing that they must do. The hardest thing is to realize that nothing lasts forever. The hardest thing is to say goodbye. The show doesn't only carry this message to its own characters, but to the audience as well. It is a really bittersweet message to leave out on. Okay, I think I feel a bit better now. So, what do I think of the series finale? Well, first of all, the pacing is very consistent and while not every question can be answered here, at least the significant ones are explained, explicitly or not. One of the main examples is Anne's other shoe. Also, hot damn, that freaking action scene featuring the girls in their calamity forms and this awesome rendition of No Big Deal? It reeks of Powerpuff Girls, it reeks of anime, and I absolutely love it. Probably a top 3 scene in the entire show. I've seen this scene over 50 times and it never gets old, especially Marcy's part which is just so adorable. The girls have honed their respective abilities and they become such a powerful force, the power of friendship. The scene where Anne wakes up in the afterlife is pretty surreal and trippy for an amphibia episode. I love the minor details in the the hut she enters, like the pictures of her friends and families, also Anne's other shoe just like I mentioned earlier. Her encounter with the actual multiverse god is part uncanny, part hilarious, whether because the god is voiced by the same person who voiced Ruby or this scene. My true form would make your human brain explode. I don't know, I've seen some pretty crazy- <laughs> This feels like a scene out of a show like Infinity Train if you ask me. This is basically Anne's final test of her frog conversion in Amphibia. She already knows who she is, she has made a big sacrifice for the greater good, and now she is faced with a choice to remain dead or to return to where she belongs. But Anne still has a lot to live for. She still has 78 more years on Earth and she can spend all that time to keep growing as a person. And it is such an endearing conclusion to Anne's character arc. Then the girls finally say goodbye to each of their amphibian families. There's of course the scene that is just too emotional for words as the animation speaks for itself. And finally there's the time skip epilogue which ties the themes of the show up quite perfectly. I am so obsessed with the townies new design especially Polly, Sprig, and Ivy. And then there's the adult calamity trio. I like that we get insight on what their future jobs are and how it connects to their characters and their past experiences. It's also kind of sad that Anne and Sasha don't hang out too much anymore as years go by. But it makes sense when you consider that Sasha has finally let go of that temptation to control over people. It's just life that friendships don't quite last forever but here they are now living their own lives. Nothing is more satisfying than seeing the tree of characters you love and sorting their problems out having a good ending. The ending scene is wonderful and Anne's final words sum up the overall message of the show. It can be the hardest thing to realize you can't hold on to something forever. Sometimes you have to let it go. But of the things you let go, You'd be surprised what makes its way back to you. 
I love this finale so much. I am so so happy that they managed to stick the landing considering how much of a train wreck the Star vs finale was and how much they had to work with after the lighthearted vibes of season 3A. I understand why Matt thought that this finale was going to be divisive among Amphibia fans depending on how you view the story and the characters. Many people were frustrated because the girls won't be able to return to Amphibia again. But personally, this is a good closure to the series. I was not at all disappointed other than the fact that I won't be able to watch a new Amphibia episode again. And again, it's sad but you know, let's take away the positives. I am really happy that I managed to watch the show in the first week of release. I am also really happy that I can gain online friends, new or old, that enjoy the show as much as I do. But most importantly, I'm happy that I can be a fan. I'm happy that I relate to the characters, find the humor funny, and occasionally get emotional because you've been attached to these characters for quite a while and you're not gonna see them again. But whoever is watching this and is a big Amphibia fan, I'm just telling you to cherish those memories about the show for as long as you can. Don't let the fire die out. Because memories are the only way to keep a disconnected bond alive. Which brings me to my number one spot on this list. The episode that I still think is the best in the entire show. Here we go. I have a lot of memories of being in this fandom and while watching the show, good or bad. But nothing can top the moment where I watched True Colors for the first time. It was a weird time because I remember the community wasn't that big and it was released through a messy complication that was stirred with controversy which honestly still upsets me to this day. But regardless of that, I watched the season 2 finale. And it is one of the few episodes I've watched in my life that actually broke me. It actively played with my emotions. It messed me up so hard. Probably that had to do with me being a pretty big fan of the show up until that point. All I know is when the end credits rolled, I felt a lot of emotions. Frustration, sadness, shock. I know that those might sound pretty negative, but if we're being honest, True Colors' greatest strength is its emotional potency. I feel so bad for Anne who has to deal with this incredible amount of tribulations. She feels angry because of Sasha, she feels shocked because of Marcy, she feels miserable because of Sprig. Sasha feels guilty after throwing her friendship out the window, and Marcy feels depressed because she feels alone. There is just a lot of feels to be had for these characters. Maybe that's why this episode gets to me. The characters are going through a lot of things, and as someone who has followed their struggles, it's just tough to watch. Another thing that True Colors is really good at is its ability to change the trajectory of the entire show. It's not really trying to subvert the viewer's expectations if you've paid close attention to the show up until this point. We did expect Sasha to betray Anne once again, and the rematch between them was coming. Since you know it was teased from the past episodes, we also sort of predicted Marcy's betrayal too if you've seen the opening scene. Anne's very subtle showings of her calamity power throughout the show finally came full circle and with a total bang. The only real big twist is obviously this one. I was absolutely floored when I watched this scene. You have no idea how long I've been worried for Marcy during the hiatus. The episode's main job is to confirm and connect the little things that have been peppered here and there, but it does the job so freaking well that we are still stupefied that those things 
actually happen on screen. As a show that has been really uplifting before, True Colors just shatters any fantasy euphoria that the girls have had. Their deepest flaws are all cut open. I'll tell you what, Andrews does a brilliant job on trying to rip their friendship apart even though he doesn't anticipate some of it. I wish I could go back to when I watched this episode for the first time. I think it's an experience that I don't think I will get in my life ever again. I know I've mostly talked from a personal standpoint but I'm not taking away from the episode's quality. It is still immaculate. The voice acting is on point, the overall writing is perfectly executed, the soundtrack is incredible, the shots and the animation are amazing. The pacing is also really smooth. I've seen plenty of people take issues with it but I don't know, the brisk pace of the entire episode just keeps me at the edge of my seats the entire time. The first half is the calm before the storm that is the second half which honestly still blows my mind to this day. It's breathtaking and the only amphibia episode that I will genuinely call a masterpiece. Easily one of the best season finales I have ever watched. I'm not overstating nor do I want to explain in detail why. Because there are tons of videos online that do the job. Heck, I even made my own video about it, so yeah. There's just so many insane things about the episode and the events surrounding it when looking back in retrospect. I hope that when I get older and I've moved on to other things, I can still recall faint memories about Anne's little journey in a little world called Amphibia. Specifically because of my memories with True Colors. And that's pretty much it for the list. I am so sorry if it's too long, I often got carried away while writing the script. Because this video isn't just all about ranks, it's about the things that I feel about these characters, things that impress me about this show, and things that made me learn a lesson or two. You can partially think of it as a diary of sorts. Revisiting these episodes made me adore and admire the show even more now that the full story is out. And just like I said in the beginning of this video, I love that each episode, no matter how good or bad, plays some sort of role for the show. Watching this show is such a charming experience because you get to see the characters change in some kind of way and a lot of things have happened ever since I first watched Amphibia. Obviously the pandemic struck the world, I got accepted to my dream university, I went through a lot more exams, I lived on my own. We all change over time, it can be really tough to do such a thing but don't worry, just like the old saying goes, it's no big deal. Thank you so much Matt and the entire crew for creating the show, I can confidently say that this show will age well down the road. Take this video as my last big offering for the show as I think I will try to focus on other things in the future. But don't worry, Amphibia will definitely not go anywhere for me. It's one of those shows that I will not forget for quite a while. So thank you for watching this video. Thank you for making it this far. I really appreciate your support up until this point. As my final words, if you've ever faced an obstacle, you gotta rib it, rib it, jump on it. <laughs>